The sauce. She's a sweet little one. That's what crossed my mind as I revved up the lawn mower on that bright Saturday morning. The Briggs and Stratton engine roared to life with a single pull of the starter cord. I looked over at the two-year-old girl, snug in her car seat on our new porch, exchanging a smile with me. The sun was already blazing high, pushing temperatures over 80 degrees, and it wasn't even 9 a.m. yet. The notorious Texas heat lived up to its reputation. I had dressed down to a tank top and shorts, ready to tackle the wilderness our front yard had become in our new Dallas suburb home. Two years ago, if you had told me I'd be a single parent in Texas, I'd have found it humorous. Yet, here I was. Cutting through the unkempt grass felt like a constant vigil, metaphorically and literally keeping an eye out. I frequently glanced back to check on my daughter, ensuring she was safe and shaded on the porch, yet positioned so she could see me as I moved around the yard. At 29, wrestling with the wild grass made me feel unexpectedly old. I reminisced about my younger days, breezing through lawn mowing at my parents' place and earning from the neighbors, all without breaking a sweat. Now, halfway through a smaller lawn, I felt worn out. I barely noticed her approach, silent as a whisper. When I did, it was almost too late, but I quickly turned, ready for anything. My daughter was secure in her seat, and the car, stocked with essential and backup documents, was ready for a quick getaway if needed. But the tension dissolved with her friendly greeting, hi neighbor. She was strikingly tall and robust, yet carried an undeniable beauty, with a voice that sang. Her presence was commanding, yet graceful, her attire modest yet accentuating her form. Her confident demeanor seemed to bask in the attention, much like enjoying the warmth of the sun. Welcome to the neighborhood, she exclaimed warmly. I thought I'd come over and introduce myself to you and your family member. If you need anything to settle in here, feel free to ask. I smiled, trying to maintain eye contact. Why don't you meet her? I suggested. That's when I noticed the tray she was holding, adorned with three chilled glasses of some unknown beverage. We reached the porch, and I paused by the baby seat. This is my daughter, Alyssa. I call her Allie for short. She set the tray on the porch railing and peered at Allie. Allie's expression turned into a frown, her tiny lips puckering and her gaze sharpening, as if she felt the woman was intruding. My goodness, the woman exclaimed, she looks so much like you. She has your hair, your eyes, and even your nose. Does she resemble her mother in any way? I'd love to meet her too. She's the one, I replied. I'm Mike. It's just Allie and me here. That's wonderful, she beamed, her smile widening. I'm Margarita, but you can call me Rita. I noticed you outside and wanted to invite you both to dinner at my place. We'd appreciate that, I responded, if it's no bother. She grinned, gesturing towards the tray. And since you were out here, I thought you might like some of my homemade. Lemonade. I guessed, my attention shifting away from her attire to her gesture. She leaned back, laughing lightly. Yes, my special lemonade. Would you like some? Just then, the atmosphere shifted. Allie began to cry, reaching out for me. What's wrong? Rita asked, puzzled. She might be overheated, I said quickly, lifting Allie into my arms to take her inside, leaving Rita on the porch. It took a while, but I managed to soothe Allie, feeding her and cleaning up after her. Then, carrying her around the house, I gently rocked her, narrating her favorite story until she fell asleep. After placing her back in the seat, I went out to finish the yard work. Maybe it was the lingering frustration, or perhaps I had more energy after tackling the tougher chores earlier, but I breezed through tidying up the yard. Following that, I pulled out the bucket and carted my cleaning gear to spruce up the car. Just as I was finishing up, two things vied for my attention. First, I heard Allie stirring on the porch, calling out as she wrestled with the confines of her car seat. She was as mobile as any toddler but hadn't mastered the art of escaping her seat, which kept her out of trouble more often than not. Liberating my daughter from her seat, I was drawn to the second distraction, the melodious strains of piano music from next door. I pondered whether Rita was the pianist. Curiosity led me to the second story of my house, peering into the neighboring yard. Rita's space was a picturesque haven compared to mine, complete with a tasteful deck and what seemed like a hot tub. There, Rita lounged on a recliner, engrossed in paperwork, possibly grating if she were an educator, hinted at by the glasses resting on her nose. While I took in the scene, my gaze inadvertently lingered on Rita, absorbed in her task. Her presence, accentuated by the warm glow of the evening sun and her serene expression, sparked a moment of reflection on my earlier behavior towards her. Feeling hungry, Allie? I inquired, looking down at my little sidekick. Hungry, Allie? She echoed. With Allie in my arm, I ventured into the backyard and called out to Rita over the fence with a friendly hey. Soon, I saw Rita's head appear above the fence, greeting me with a knowing smile. The sight of her sparkling brown eyes and the delicate features of her face captivated me. Mike, can you hear me? Rita inquired. Is the music too loud? What's on your mind? I took a moment to collect my thoughts before responding. Rita, I wanted to apologize for earlier. My reaction wasn't about you. It seems I was caught up in memories from our past, and it set me on edge. Apology accepted, she smiled warmly. I'm quite resilient, you know. There was no harm done. It's just how things go sometimes, we're all unique in our own way. And I'm aware that I might not be everyone's favorite. Oh, is it too late to take up that dinner offer? I responded with a grin. 
I didn't promise anything, she replied cheerfully. I merely suggested it. And I eagerly agreed, I retorted with a smile. So, here I am, ready to join. I handed her alley over the fence, catching her off guard, but she accepted. Then, I clambered over the fence to her hearty laughter. You two seem quite eager for dinner, she chuckled. Allie's ready to eat, my daughter exclaimed. I'll go change into something more appropriate while you start the grill, Rita announced. There's no need to change for me, I said. I think I should, she replied with a teasing glance, and then, realizing my discomfort, she added, I wouldn't want any accidents with the grill. So, let me just change quickly. She passed Allie back to me and headed to her house, her movement catching my attention. I placed my daughter on the chair Rita had vacated and approached the grill. It was a compact propane model, not too complicated to operate. I opened the gas valve and ignited the burner with a lighter from a nearby shelf. Rita returned shortly, bringing some delicious-looking steaks and corn, already seasoned and marinated. You anticipated my return, I observed. I took a gamble, she replied with a smile. Turning around, I noticed my daughter trying to dismount the chair. She landed softly on the deck, then hurriedly toddled to the corner where a large cat rested on a cushion. Allie approached the cat, introducing herself, Allie, cat, and then knelt down to pet the cat, bursting into laughter. Don't worry, she'll be fine with her. She's a very calm, old cat, Rita assured me. I placed the steaks on the grill, and Rita and I settled down to watch Allie enjoying her time with her new feline companion as the evening sun set. We enjoyed a delightful evening, and our conversation was seamless and lively. The easy rapport between Rita and me highlighted our mutual attraction from the start. She was incredibly open, and I often found myself captivated by her expressive brown eyes. Her humor and candidness, often at her own expense, made me feel a deep connection with her, stirring feelings of affection. At one point, I stepped away to fetch some of Allie's favorite snacks from the house. I returned with her beloved chicken nuggets, heating them on the grill, alongside some applesauce for dessert and green beans, which she usually ate only with great distraction. Yet, that evening, even my persuasion couldn't draw her away from her new friend. Allie, let's head home for dinner, sweetheart, I called to her. Allie, cat, da da, she responded with determination. The surprise must have been evident on my face as Allie had always prioritized me over anything else, and now a cat had captivated her attention more than I could. Take it easy, Mike, Rita comforted. She'll be perfectly safe with me for the few minutes you need to grab her meal. I must have looked doubtful because Rita continued reassuring me, not realizing the extent of trust I was placing in her. Yet, somehow, I felt a deep sense of trust towards Rita. Preparing to hop back over the fence, I heard Rita's laughter and turned to see the mirth dancing in her eyes, enchanting me once again. You could admire the view while you clamber back over, but wouldn't the gate be simpler? She teased. Gate. I echoed, puzzled. She pointed it out, and there it was, just a short distance from where I was about to climb. And do you know what's near your house, just past my gate? She quizzed with a twinkle in her eye. I merely shrugged, still captivated by her gaze. Your gate, she revealed with a chuckle. Following her direction, I found and used the gate, marveling at its proximity to our homes. I quickly fetched Allie's dinner. As Allie dined, Rita and I delved deeper into conversation. Rita shared her life story, describing a normal upbringing in Florida and how she felt there was nothing extraordinary about herself. Despite early physical changes that made her self-conscious, after college, she stumbled into modeling due to limited job opportunities. It might surprise you, given my figure, she mentioned with a hint of bashfulness. Not at all, I said. I could really envision you in the modeling world. Mike, that's kind of you, but no, she replied. It was awkward. I did some modeling, mainly in clothing catalogs. It felt so awkward. The pay was good, but I left as soon as I found something better. Now, I work as an editor for a women's lifestyle magazine, which really aligns with my college degree. I get to stay fully clothed and put my education to use. She glanced at me and playfully gestured towards my face. Am I putting you to sleep with my chatter? She teased. Not at all, Rita, I responded with a smile. You're so captivating, I'm completely mesmerized. She burst into laughter, stopping only when she noticed I was not laughing. Mike, I feel so out of shape, she confessed. To me, you're absolutely perfect, I reassured her. In typical perplexing fashion, her smile was tinged with sadness, and I noticed her eyes dim slightly. Looking to lighten the atmosphere, she suggested, Mike, the steaks must be ready by now. How about we dine at your place? I followed her gaze and saw Allie, peacefully asleep, next to Rita's content cat. You handle the food. I'll settle the little one into bed, she proposed, sparking a warm feeling inside me. I carried my daughter home, placed her in her bed with her cherished toy, and ensured her comfort with a slightly open door and a nightlight, maintaining the routine despite her growing independence. Returning to the kitchen, I found no sign of Rita. She was on the couch near my peculiarly situated Texas fireplace, asking, can we light it? Her playful pout made it impossible to say no. Soon, we sat in the dim glow of the fire, the air conditioning countering the outside heat, adding a touch of romance to the setting. This is so romantic, she whispered, her voice tinged with a hint of regret. What's gotten worse? I inquired. Mike, I'm a decent person. 
So what you're hoping for isn't going to occur tonight, she explained. She looked at me with a pained expression. She moved closer and rested her head on my shoulder. Mike, I haven't been completely honest, she admitted. I omitted many details. After college, finding a job was challenging. The offers I received were appealing, but the pay was too low to live on. That's why I entered the modeling industry. However, what I did wasn't really modeling. I was on a webcam site. Both men and women paid to watch and interact with me online. And yes, Mike, I ended up revealing myself. It seems like men have always been curious about my appearance. On that website, they got their wish. It paid well, but I felt terrible about it. And there was always this push to go further. What kind of push are you talking about? I asked. She attempted to distance herself, but I pulled her close again. They proposed a lot of money for me to enter adult films, she revealed. Mike, they offered me $50,000 for a short scene with my friend, Brenda. Brenda and I are very different. She has an amazing figure but isn't as fortunate in the looks department. I couldn't help but chuckle. And Mike, the world can be quite harsh. I think my parents protected me too much. I was naive to the extent of people's cruelty. I encountered many men who made promises they never intended to keep. She paused as a tear rolled down her cheek, her voice faltering. I embraced her more firmly. Mike, most of them were only interested in one thing. Ironically, many couldn't actually handle it. There were a few who pursued me relentlessly, only to panic at the last moment. A couple of them got overly excited just by seeing me. But the worst was someone I dated for a while. He painted a beautiful future, Mike. We had plans, and supposedly, we were going to get engaged after a year. I was completely committed, and I thought I was in love. After about a month, we became intimate, and it was decent, though not everything I hoped for. I assumed we would have more opportunities. However, there was no next time. I woke up full of love, only to find myself the subject of ridicule at work. The guys there were making disrespectful comments. When I tried to contact him, I got nothing but his voicemail. Then, Brenda, looking disheveled, pulled me aside to reveal that my so-called love had bragged about our night to everyone, sharing details about me, some of which were false. My webcam activities were relatively modest by the standards of the time. I avoided full exposure, revealing just a hint of my chest at the end of each session, always keeping it mostly covered. Brenda, on the other hand, had fewer reservations. She often appeared completely unveiled, engaging in activities that were too private for me to consider, even when alone, and used masks to maintain an air of mystery. Despite our close friendship, Brenda found it difficult to disclose something more personal. Someone had discreetly placed a phone near her bed and recorded an intimate moment, which was then shared online without her consent. This breach of privacy led to legal action to remove the content and a deep mistrust in others, as the individual boasted about the incident. I've heard it said that for every man who disrespects women, there's a woman who has shaped him so. However, there are undeniably many disrespectful men out there. Mike, you seem different, and I sense a genuine affection from you. You do notice my appearance, which is natural, but today you look beyond that, which made me feel valued. Yet, if you wish to get closer, understand that it will require patience due to my past experiences. As we continued our conversation, it became clear that any advance towards intimacy would need to be gradual, to avoid repeating past pains. When I momentarily distanced myself, it seemed to confirm her fears of being viewed as vulnerable due to her past and appearance, prompting a defensive reaction. However, after clarifying my intentions and affirming her value, the atmosphere softened. She rejoined me, her presence comforting, though she playfully reminded me of the boundaries we had not yet crossed. Rita, I regret the tough times you've faced. Some people can be truly insensitive. It's important to remember that this kind of behavior isn't confined to any one gender. You've faced a lot, I know, and while your experiences are valid, it's crucial to believe that not everyone will cause you pain. You need to find the strength to trust again. Rita, did you notice when I stepped out earlier? I went to check on Ali. It's something I do often, almost instinctively. Even in the middle of the night, I find myself ensuring she's okay before I can rest again. I should have mentioned where I was going. I'm about to share something with you that's quite personal, and it's a big deal for me to trust someone with this information. I've never opened up about it before, which shows how much I trust you. I work in civil engineering for the city. I'm fairly new to the role here in Dallas, and it's a bit different from what I was used to in Michigan, but I'm adapting. At 29, I'm a few years younger than you, but that doesn't bother me at all. When I started this journey, I was 26, fresh out of college. It took me six years to finish my four-year engineering degree, not because I couldn't handle the coursework, but because I initially focused more on football and having a good time. I was convinced I'd make it to the NFL and didn't consider other career paths. However, an injury during my second year ended those dreams. Looking back, I see it as a blessing in disguise. It was hard to accept at first, but I grew up in a family that taught me resilience and determination, just like yours seems to have done. Eventually, I came to terms with the fact that my football dreams were not meant to be. I devoted 15 years to the sport, starting from when I was just five, until the injury stopped me. 
Many pursue this dream, with places like Ohio being notorious for their intense focus on football. Texas has a similar vibe. Despite excelling in college, many players don't make it in the professional league. I realized I was one of those when I reviewed my old games. My play simply wasn't as strong as I thought. After my injury, when I returned to school, I acknowledged the time I had lost. The early classes I took didn't contribute to a clear career path. I hadn't even chosen a major. Nowadays, many athletes are in a similar boat, majoring in general studies without focusing on essential academic subjects, essentially concentrating on their sport. After graduating, I chose to remain in Michigan, drawn to its seasonal charm. I reveled in the outdoor activities it offered, fishing and water skiing in summer, enjoying the winter sports when it snowed. Michigan's spring and autumn are breathtaking, attracting visitors worldwide for the autumn foliage. However, I doubt I'll return there soon. Two years post-college, working in a Detroit suburb, we were involved in a project for a new freeway on-ramp, which required modifications to local residences, including utility rerouting. It was during this project that I met her. Our team informed her about the utility marking on her property. She seemed to be in her late 30s, but claimed to be 32, a fact I later learned was untrue. She appeared quite ordinary, with collar-length light brown hair and glasses, an unremarkable figure you might pass daily. Her heavy eye makeup struck me as unusual, and she smoked on her porch as we began our work. Her gaze lingered on me, unabashedly curious, even approaching to observe our work closely. As my team worked, I measured the property, drafting a detailed map, while she stayed near, unselfconscious about her tattoos and casual attire. She eventually offered me homemade lemonade, a refreshing treat on that scorching day, and kindly offered a refill, to which I responded considerately. It's no bother at all, honey, she remarked, retreating into her home with a noticeable sway in her step. There was something about her movement that made her seem more curvaceous. Once she disappeared, my buddies didn't hold back. So, are you planning to sneak in for a visit, or will you catch up with her later? Inquired my crew leader, known as Mac. What are you implying, Mac? I countered. Mike, that woman from the trailer park seems keen on you, he chuckled. Just a friendly tip, always be prepared. Another piece of advice, added Jack from the crew. Always bring your own stuff, you can't be too careful. She's not old, I defended. She's just 32. Laughter erupted among them. Mike, she's been around longer than that, Mac jested. Before they could continue, she returned, making sure to catch my attention as she moved about. Her gestures were hard to ignore, and as a young single man, I was somewhat charmed. By the end of the day, she boldly invited me to dinner. Would you mind keeping me company for dinner after work? I hate eating alone, she proposed, earnestly. It's just dinner, no pressure. If you come, great. If not, that's okay too. All the way back, the crew teased me relentlessly, unaware of her invitation. Mike, are you testing our health plan soon? Mac joked. Calvin, the newest member, had his moment too. Mike, when should I record your TV debut? He teased. Calvin, what are you getting at? I asked. He smirked. Just want to catch your big moment on TV, buddy. Despite their ribbing, I did go back after work. Perhaps it was the allure of a free meal and some company that swayed me. When I arrived at her place, she was lounging on a recliner on her front porch, casually positioned with a leg draped over the side. It seemed like she was dressed in shorts that were just a bit too revealing. As I approached, she nonchalantly adjusted her posture, maintaining an air of deliberate exposure. Next to her, a glass of lemonade sat beside an unfinished beer, as if she had anticipated my arrival. I accepted the lemonade and took a sip. This lemonade gets them every time, she said with a knowing smirk. Why do you call it world famous? I inquired. It's just a name, she replied casually. It doesn't really mean anything. I'm sure it's just known among my circle. But it's nice to feel that there's something special about us, something we excel in amidst this vast world. To most, I'm just another person out there, but I like to think I have my specialties where I truly shine. And those would be. I prompted, eager to hear more. Lemonade and making an impression, she stated plainly, as if discussing the weather or some mundane fact of life. Her openness took me by surprise, it was a rare frankness about personal skills. The conversation and her company were unexpectedly intoxicating. As we continued talking, she teased the idea of showing me her other specialty. The evening from that point on became a hazy memory. The next day, while having lunch, flashes of the previous night's events started coming back to me, including a humorous mishap leading to a bruise on my shin from a clumsy rush upstairs. I recalled an evening filled with playful encounters and laughter, punctuated by moments of shared intimacy and comfort. After a whirlwind of excitement, we ended up sharing leftover pizza and eventually drifted into a peaceful sleep, only to be awakened later for more heartfelt conversation and connection. By morning, I was recounting the events, marveling at the unexpected depth of our encounter, and realizing just how memorable the night had been. Good, she said, that leaves us some time. She moved closer, reigniting the intensity between us. She was the most uninhibited person I'd ever encountered. Everything was possible with her. I had to leave at 7.30 to freshen up and get ready for work. When will you be back? She inquired. I was puzzled, not recalling any promise to return. 
Um, I started. Leanne, she offered with a smile. You're Mike, right? I confirmed with a nod. Mike, despite the no strings talk, last night meant a lot to me. Is there anything better waiting for you tonight than what we shared? I considered briefly and replied, no. I'll cook dinner this time, she suggested. Maybe something grilled. That sounds nice, I agreed, and she sealed it with a passionate embrace, drawing me in closely once more. Back at my place, I showered and changed, feeling a mix of exhaustion and exhilaration. That night was legendary, the kind men often reminisce about. I kept the details from my co-workers, pondering the events instead. In daylight, I recognized certain discomforts. Our conversations were sparse, she often redirected our chats back to passion, suggesting either secrets or a shared focus on physical connection rather than emotional depth. But it made sense, why would she, settled in her own life, seek more from someone my age? Yet, youth had its perks, and post-work, I was eager for another passionate encounter. To my astonishment, the door opened to reveal a stunning young woman, close to my age. Our eyes met, sparking an instant connection. Leanne soon appeared, grasping my arm. You've met my daughter, she noted. Caught off guard, I managed to joke, really. You hardly look old enough to have a grown daughter. Leanne chuckled. She's not old at all, silly, she told me. Only 19. She leaned in closer, her voice dropping to a whisper. She's quite innocent, not privy to the grown-up moments we're about to explore. Think of last night as just a teaser. I felt a lump in my throat, and as we made our way back to the porch, I noticed her daughter awkwardly adjusting her jeans. Reaching the porch, two energetic boys, looking about seven and ten, bounded onto it and disappeared into the house. My mouth fell open in surprise, and Leanne just offered a knowing smile. Are they yours as well? I queried. She nodded. Incredible, how many children do you have? I continued, astonished. Five in total, she responded. The other two are spending the summer with their Aunt Kate on her farm. They'll be back in a few weeks. I was speechless, taking in the bustling household. Let's get the barbecue going, she suggested. She whispered again, once the night settles and the kids are asleep, we'll have our time. Her daughter emerged again, dressed in a tight tank top and shorts, echoing Leanne's style from the previous evening. Mom, I'm heading to Brittany's, she announced. I'll call before coming back. I got busy with the grill, and Leanne set out steaks and burgers. Steaks for us, she beamed, the boys prefer burgers. I was just like them at that age, I remarked, feeling more at ease. The atmosphere lightened, and we all enjoyed a pleasant evening. I taught the boys to play football, while Leanne handled the cleanup. The boys were curious, bombarding me with questions, and I engaged with them wholeheartedly. As dusk settled, Leanne brought out sparklers for the boys, and we all shared in the playful glow. Hide and seek was next, with me hiding and the boys seeking, their excitement palpable with each successful scare. Their joy was infectious, and the game repeated until bedtime beckoned. When Leanne returned, her smile was tinged with reminiscence. They haven't been this joyful since we lost their dad, she confided. I was about to delve deeper, offering sympathy, but she shifted the mood. Guiding my hand discreetly, she whispered, now, let's make the most of our evening. The connection was warm, leading to an intense, yet conflicted kiss. It was a moment of profound connection, marred only by the remnants of her habits. Yet, in that complexity, the depth of our interaction was unmistakably real. After about 20 minutes, all my previous concerns had vanished. The only thing on my mind was the intense connection we were about to share, with the anticipation of the wait being a close second. I'll go check on the kids, she whispered amid our tender kisses. You go get comfortable in the bed. It didn't take long for her to return, and shortly after I settled in, she was beside me. It was clear she was as eager as I was. Our connection was immediate and intense, her sounds of joy were a symphony to my ears. My affection for Leanne deepened with each moment. Some curiosities lingered from the night before, but the intimacy we shared seemed to provide the answers. In that instant, with her embrace tied around me, I felt a bliss like never before. Our passionate encounter felt boundless, with the present moment consuming all attention. At one point, a fleeting movement caught my eye, but when I looked, nothing was there. Our arrangement with Leanne was clear from the start, no commitments. Yet, I couldn't deny the comfort and joy this routine brought, far surpassing the solitude of my previous life. Compared to my peers, both single and married, my situation felt enviable. My single friends spent their nights in search of companionship, often ending in disappointment, while my married colleagues navigated the complexities of their relationships, with genuine intimacy seeming like a rare occurrence. In contrast, my nights were consistently fulfilling, filled with passionate, playful, or tender moments with Leanne. We explored every facet of our connection, always seeking new ways to deepen our bond. My feelings for Leanne and the life we shared filled me with a sense of belonging and happiness. I had become an integral part of her and her children's lives, often bringing small joys to brighten their days. The only challenge was Jean, Leanne's eldest, who seemed critical of our relationship and choices. Whenever Leanne was out or not paying attention, she would make flirtatious gestures at me. Why do you spend your nights with someone who's much older than you? She once inquired. Look Jean, I care deeply for your mom, I explained. 
Sure, there's an age gap, but if you really care for her, you'd be happy she's content. She just gave me a puzzled look. A few days later, she was back at her antics. While Leanne was preoccupied, Jean started to subtly show off in front of me as I watched TV, edging her skirt higher in a provocative manner. I had mentioned Jean's behavior to Leanne, who brushed it off, saying, Mike, that girl has been lacking a father figure. She's just seeking attention. Is it something we should worry about? Not at all, I assured her. Then, don't make a fuss. Let her be, Leanne responded. So, when Jean began her performance again, I just observed, noting her graceful, dancer-like legs. She turned around, showcasing her figure in a way that was notably different from her mother's. You enjoy this, don't you, Mike? She teased, which only annoyed me. I understand, Jean, I responded irritably. You don't approve of me. You wish I wasn't here. She laughed. Mike, you're misunderstanding, she retorted. I just think you're with the wrong person. But eventually, I thought you were more reserved, I remarked, echoing her mother's impressions. There's always a first time, she flirted, implying a future between us, contrasting the fleeting time with her mother to the endless time she envisioned with me. As she spoke, a chill crept up my spine, reminiscent of someone disrespecting sacred ground. Visions of an intense connection flashed before me, yet I knew it was an impossibility. I would never betray my commitment. Everything she offers you, she claimed, I can provide too, even more. It's as if I'm her, only younger, fresher, more appealing. She sauntered off, her skirt lifted just so, leaving a memorable image as she exited. That night, Leanne seemed withdrawn. Concerned, I inquired, what's troubling you, honey? I don't want us to part ways, she murmured tenderly. Let's discuss it later. Later when? I prodded, but her response was to embrace me warmly, her affection encompassing me wholly. Our union was profound, each moment savored as though it were our last. It felt like she was desperately trying to convey her entire essence to me. I'll miss this, she whispered. Why? I questioned. Remember, no commitments, she hinted. But Leanne, I love you, I confessed. I seek that bond. Mike, I'm expecting, she revealed. Silence overtook me. I'm six weeks along. It likely happened early on when we got together. I may have been too enthusiastic. I apologize. It's been a while since I've been with anyone, especially after my husband's passing. I'll manage, yet I don't want you to feel burdened. I lay there, gazing at the ceiling, contemplating. This is something I need to fully commit to, I acknowledged. I've grown fond of your sons, and now, I must ensure fairness. What do you mean? She inquired. I need to be equitable, I explained. I don't want any child to feel less loved or valued, especially because he's biologically mine. Mike, you can see him whenever you wish, she started. I'll be here, I affirmed. He'll be just down the hall. Leaving you or our child is unthinkable. Mike, I'm still taken aback by your declaration of love, she expressed. That's not news anymore, I replied. It's common knowledge. I embraced her tenderly, conveying through my touch how much she meant to me. Mike, we should prepare, she suggested. After this baby arrives, we'll think about expanding our family. We'll need a larger home then, I remarked. The following months were delightful. Leanne and I shared intimate moments until the baby's arrival. However, intimacy wasn't all we shared. We also spent quality time together, strengthening our bond as a family. But Jean remained a thorn in our side. It should have been me, Jean spat enviously. I should be the one with your child. Seeing you with her makes me furious. You remain so attentive to her, even as she grew more pregnant. That care was absent in her past pregnancies. You were meant to be with me. When it was time for Leanne to go to the hospital, I was a bundle of nerves, excited yet apprehensive about fatherhood. We arrived at the hospital, and after some discussion, they allowed me to be with her in the delivery room. Dressed in scrubs, I entered the room, but the intensity overwhelmed me, and I fainted. When I regained consciousness, everything was over. I eagerly asked to see Leanne and our newborn. The nurse smiled and nodded. Leanne looked weary, as though she had endured a tremendous ordeal. Despite what my friends might say about her, in that moment, she was the epitome of beauty to me, and I started envisioning our future together. Are you disappointed? She inquired. Disappointed about what? I responded. She beamed, Mike Jr. is actually a girl. We need to think of another name. We named her Alyssa, after my mother, and she was the epitome of beauty in my eyes. After a while, Leanne and I slowly rediscovered our physical connection, adjusting to our new life with care and patience. It might feel different now, she mentioned one evening. Let's not worry about that, I reassured her. What matters is our connection and love. I understood what needed to be done, yet a part of me hesitated. Life got busy with taking care of Allie, and it took me six months after her birth to finally buy Leanne a ring. My deepest wish was for us to be a family. Sharing a secret has a way of bringing people together, so I sought Jean's opinion on the ring. Her response caught me off guard. Take it back, she whispered, tears rolling down her face. You don't have to marry her, you should marry me. Her words struck a chord, and I felt torn. After much contemplation, every logical thought pointed towards marrying Allie's mother. On a quiet Wednesday afternoon, I bought a large bouquet and headed home early. The house was empty, and as I checked on Allie in her crib, feeling the bond with my daughter, I knew I had matters to settle with her mother. Leaving Allie's room, I heard noises from our bedroom. 
Expecting mundane activity, I was horrified to discover Leanne in a compromising situation with our neighbors. Leanne was entangled with them in a way that betrayed our relationship. Her familiar moans filled the room. I was frozen in disbelief, recalling warnings from friends about such betrayals. My shock gradually turned to rage. They were oblivious to my presence until the flowers fell from my grasp, making a sound that brought reality crashing back. Time normalized as panic set in. Kyle tried to flee, but I was consumed by anger, feeling my dreams of family life shattering. In a desperate attempt to confront the situation, I lunged at Kyle, my actions driven by a mix of betrayal and fury. Kyle was older and shorter than me. The steel toe of my city-regulated safety boots connected with his lower abdomen. I caused significant pain, severely injuring his pelvic bone. Kyle screamed loudly and lost consciousness from the agony. My anger was uncontrollable when I saw Hal. He was just stepping out of the bed, looking guilty and disheveled. Mike, let's calm down and talk, he suggested, with a soothing tone. As he spoke, he subtly tried to open the bedroom window. Mike, please, don't be violent, Leanne pleaded. Distracted by her, I didn't notice Hal opening the window. Overwhelmed by fury, I charged at Hal with all my might, reminiscent of my football days. My intense anger fueled the attack, sending him crashing through the window and out onto the roof, where he narrowly escaped more serious harm thanks to a hedge that cushioned his fall. Hal ended up with a sprained neck, broken ribs, a dislocated shoulder, and various cuts and bruises from his rough landing in the hedges. Turning back to Leanne, I saw her in a disheveled state, which fueled my anger further. I was on the verge of possibly doing something regrettable when Jean intervened. Mike, she's not worth this, Jean said calmly, offering a comforting presence. She suggested we leave the scene and do something normal like driving lessons in my car, averting my attention from the chaos. As we talked, I realized I was still holding the ring box, which Jean noticed and asked to see again. She handled the ring delicately, admiring it in the sunlight coming through the broken window, while we could hear Hal's cries for help outside. Jean then expressed her desire to keep the ring, seeing it as a symbol of hope and redemption. Meanwhile, Leanne, still in a state of undress, rudely told Jean to leave us alone for a talk. Jean retorted sharply, highlighting the absurdity and disrespect of the situation. She took my arm, and we left the house, driving aimlessly. Our silence was therapeutic, proving its healing power. After driving quietly for about an hour, I felt a sense of relief. I feel so foolish, I admitted. Mike, why would you feel foolish? She inquired. You've done nothing wrong. It was all her. I warned you she wasn't right for you, but even I was deceived by her act. I thought she had changed her ways when you two got together. Her words left me stunned. Has she done this before? I asked. Yes, frequently, Jean replied. But they're married, I pointed out. And she's friends with their spouses. That means nothing to her, Jean countered. My mom has always been, let's say, too friendly. It's like she can't help herself. The car fell silent again. In some odd way, you were special to her. She's never let anyone get as close since. Well, you know, Jean added softly. I get it, I cut in sharply. Since your father passed. That man wasn't my father, she clarified with disdain. And they were never legally married. He was just someone she lived with, a real jerk, always acting inappropriately. And he's not dead. They lost touch in a bizarre way during a shopping trip. He disappeared, taking his belongings and leaving her behind. I need to think about my next steps, I declared. I'll drop you off and then sort things out. I barely stopped the car in front of her house before driving off. Returning to my old apartment complex, I secured a new lease, took a day off work to move, and avoided any dramatic confrontations until late in the evening, ensuring the children wouldn't be disturbed. Where have you been? She demanded, her tone sharp. I've been trying to reach you all day. Do you not have your key? Leanne, let's not fight. I'm just here to collect my things, I replied, handing her the documents. She placed them carelessly on the desk. Mike, we need to discuss this, she insisted. You can't just leave. I've rented a new place, I informed her. Are the authorities involved? Al and Kyle ended up in different medical facilities. Both incidents are reported as accidents. They needed to keep it quiet from their spouses, so there's no investigation, she explained. I'm the only one looking for you. Leanne, I understand you're upset about what I witnessed, but I don't think we can move past this. We're not tied down legally, and you're free to make your choices, but so am I you've made it clear how you value our relationship, and that's fine for you, but it's not something I can accept. Our views on commitment differ too much. She continued, detailing the injuries and the lengths she went to cover up the situation, expressing how the violence and deceit had left her feeling more ashamed than valued. In all my years, I've never caused such chaos, she lamented. I had to weave a web of lies to cover up the mess, ensuring the hospitals didn't link the incidents. She recounted the fabricated story given to Kyle's hospital to explain his injuries, highlighting the severity of the situation and the emotional toll it took on her. I informed the staff at the other hospital that Hal had an accident falling off the roof and ended up in the bushes, and they believed it. I explained to their spouses that we had a roofing issue, and Hal and Kyle went up to assess it. Unfortunately, they both slipped. Hal was fortunate to land in the bushes, while Kyle encountered a different fate. 
The extent of their injuries and their recovery is uncertain, but we'll address it in time. I was speechless, astounded by her audacity to pin the blame on me. I couldn't fathom her attempting to make me feel responsible for the mishap. An old coach of mine used to say, the best defense is a good offense. I had naively hoped for Leanne to seek my forgiveness, yet she went on the offensive, putting the fault on me and twisting the narrative against me. Jean intervened, there's nothing to sort out, mom. You're overlooking the obvious. Mike has been part of our lives for a year, covering expenses, providing for us, and sharing your life as if a family. The children view him as a parental figure, he's integral to their lives. And what about your friends, mom? They barely know your children, using you without offering anything meaningful in return. Jean didn't stop there. Mom, Mike showed you genuine love. Can you say the same for those men? Mike was committed, he wasn't just after a fling. He wanted something real with you. She then revealed a ring, signifying Mike's intention to propose, highlighting the contrast between his sincere affection and the fleeting attention from the others. Jean's words laid bare the reality, challenging their mother to see the depth of Mike's commitment compared to the superficial interactions with the other men. Leanne gazed at the ring before tears welled up in her eyes. Jean seized the moment, delivering a cutting remark. But it's too late, mother. You've pushed him too far. When Mike moved in, despite your welfare checks and food stamps, this house was nearly lost. With him covering the bills, you could use your checks and the food money for Mike to settle the unpaid taxes. Then, you stretched the food stamps, which we probably shouldn't have had, given Mike's earnings, to cover groceries. Mike might not have realized your financial savvy, right? But mother, Mike is leaving. The most dependable man in your life is on his way out, and here you are, defending those who mistreated you. How will you manage without his financial support? Leanne sobbed, unable to confront us. I know your plan, mother. You think you can just apply for more welfare and then demand child support from Mike, knowing his job and workplace, hoping to cash in twice for Alyssa. That won't work, mom, because Mike has already arranged child support for Alyssa. Those papers are official, tying things up with the state. You won't get any extra money for Alyssa. And once we relocate, we might even take her from you. What are you implying, Jean? Leanne retorted sharply. You two aren't going anywhere. Mike has two big reasons to stay. Regaining her composure, she raised two fingers to emphasize her point. Firstly, there's the bond with his daughter. He's been there since her very beginning, witnessing her growth. He may be upset with me, but he won't leave his child. Jean seemed to lose some steam, and Leanne capitalized on this. But the main reason Mike will stay is me, she declared. He values what we have. He might leave temporarily, but he'll return because he misses what only I provide. Jean snickered at that statement. And who do you think could take my place, young lady? Leanne challenged, laughing heartily. It's not you, Jean. Sure, you may be more attractive and younger, but that's where it ends. You lack experience. While you're still learning, Mike will grow impatient. He's an adult, Jean. He knows his needs and desires. You'll end up disappointed, and he'll inevitably return to me. Exactly as you've pointed out, mother, Jean responded with a bite in her tone. I have the advantage of youth and beauty over you, and more invigorating and untarnished by life's harsh ways. My inexperience is overshadowed by the sheer novelty and appeal, and I'm eager to learn his likes and dislikes, something you once had to navigate. I bring a promise of fidelity and a future, something you seem to have lost sight of. He will have my undivided attention and loyalty, unlike the chaos he faced with you. And if he wishes for children, we are ready to start a family. Jean, to your room this instant. Leanne commanded, her foot hitting the floor with force. I won't tolerate such insolence. But mother, I'm 19, not a child, Jean asserted. Mike, you've handed her the divorce papers, and you've heard her defense. It's clear she sees no wrongdoing on her part, not even an apology. We have nothing left here. It's time we moved on. Trust me, you won't regret this decision. She loses her hold over us the moment we walk out. And as long as you meet your responsibilities, Allie will always be part of our lives. Let's leave this mess behind us. Come on. With that, Jean left the room. I gave Leanne one last look before following Jean, ignoring Leanne sobbing behind us. Before leaving, I checked on Allie, who was stirring in her crib. I changed her diaper and then handed her to Leanne, saying, she's changed, and now she needs to be fed. I'll come by daily to see her. Mike, please don't leave, Leanne begged. We can work through this. Her eyes shifted between me and the baby now in her arms. I'll visit in the morning and after work, I assured, but I'll call first to avoid any complications. Whatever happens in your life now is none of my concern. My focus is Allie. In the days that followed, life was a whirlwind. I needed new furniture since I had left everything behind when moving in with Leanne. Jean accompanied me to ensure everything we chose was perfect, a task that turned out to be quite demanding. Our shopping trips had to fit around my work schedule, making our days long and tiring. I made it a point to visit Allie every morning and evening, adjusting my routine to accommodate these moments, even as Leanne attempted to engage in small talk during my visits. So, have you and Jean taken your relationship to the next level yet? She asked one morning, her voice laced with a mix of curiosity and spite. That's not your concern, I retorted sharply. She chuckled, I'll take that as a rejection. 
Why don't we do something more intimate to make you remember what you're missing out on? Leanne, I don't break my commitments, I declared. Mike, it's only wrong if you're caught, she argued. Besides, according to Jean, we've been an item since we got close. Since you two aren't together, there's nothing wrong. You're free to enjoy my company. I kissed Allie goodbye and headed to work. The irony was that the only obstacle to being with Jean was my own restraint. She was 19, not much younger than me, unlike her mother. We lived together and the attraction was mutual. Every evening, Jean playfully tempted me. Returning home that night, I was distracted. Jean had prepared dinner. This shouldn't have surprised me, as she often cared for the kids while Leanne and I were busy. Her domestic skills were well known. We sat at the new dining set, enjoying a splendid meal. I praised her cooking efforts, and she just smiled warmly. How about we watch the new TV after dinner? I suggested. No way, cowboy, she grinned. I've been busy setting up the house all day, then made your meal. I get to choose what we do next, and it's exploring the new bedroom furniture. We ordered two sets of bedroom furniture, I noted. One for each of us. Which one arrived? I really need a good rest. She laughed softly. Mike, you were upset about my mother at the store. But you're strong enough to move forward. There's only one bedroom set now. I canceled the other one after our store visit. As I continued eating, she added, Mike, my mother isn't always right. I may not be very experienced, but I'm mature and have had feelings for you for a long time. Plus, I know about this morning. My brother Terry and I share everything. So, your concern for my little sister and my mother's advances won't affect me. I was taken aback by her insight. My comment, is this the plan OP is going for? Or he is dumping her for something new? Comment down below, sub and bell, we will see OP move on from this drama moving forward. The final ending will come soon, sub and like to catch it.